Former United States Ambassador to the U.N., John Bolton, making headlines today for recent comments he made about China. Listen. Even today, with defense budget levels being the way they are, we, we still are the dominant power militarily. But, but so what their uh, strategy is, is to use what uh, people call generally asymmetric warfare to, to engage in cyber attacks, to try influence operations, to undercut us economically, never to confront us militarily because they know ultimately what the outcome would be, but to weaken American resolve, weaken faith in our institutions. And that's from the John Katz Matidis radio show, The Katz Roundtable, my old boss. Yeah. You, w, you on mention WABC. Him the other day? Yeah, he's, uh, he owns uh, oil refineries and grocery stores, radio station, WABC Radio, right here in New York City. As one does. I've met Ambassador Bolton a few times. He's yeah. interviewed him. He's a lovely guy. Yes. Uh, Bolton would add, we've got to wake up to this threat. We have not been willing to see it. Asymmetric warfare. I have not heard that before. Mm, Joining us yeah. now to discuss is U.S. Deputy Military Representative. These gentlemen have. I know. That's why we got them on. <laughs> They're a lot smarter than me. To NATO, Newsmax contributor General Blaine Holt and former Chief of Staff of the National Security Council, former CIA analyst Fred Flight. Uh, general Holt, I'll start off with you because you're a general. You know, Happy right? Labor Day. Happy Labor Day, sir. Thank you for your service. Uh, what do you make of jo uh, John Bolton's uh, comments there? Gosh, this is one of the few times I really agree with him wholeheartedly. <laughs> <laughs> he, uh, he's got it exactly right. Asymmetric warfare is where you take something that costs very little to put together, but it can have a massive impact on an enemy. And this is really the Chinese preference for war. They don't like bullets and missiles. Uh, they're not going to be good at that, uh, combined arms and joint warfare. But what they are good at and what they've been engaging with us, against us for decades, is soft power warfare, which is cyber influence operations, co-opting our schools, the Confucius Institute, United Front, these so-called police stations that we see popping up around the country. Um, these are all things meant to undermine our society. Corruption, co-opting elected leaders. Those are the types of operations where the Chinese excel. And oh my gosh, they devote a lot of attention to the United States in those operations. Yeah, so let's talk to Fred Flights, who may not be a general, but has served 25 plus mm -hmm. years with the CIA, uh, the, the, the really? State Department, uh, and is an expert and, and um, ha has worked uh, at the facility up near Frederick, Maryland, and there's always something uh, fishy going on up there. So he's on top of all of the above. Uh, give us your thoughts, Fred, about what China is up to. Well, I, I have worked at Fort Detrick. I've also worked for John Bolton. He's a good guy. Uh, I agree with the general that, the, that China is not just pursuing asymmetric warfare, it's also pursuing soft power. And there's an example in the Wall Street Journal, I think it's coming out tomorrow, how Japanese, uh, China, Chinese tourists are trying to sneak onto U.S. Air Force bases, pretending to, to, many, to be tourists, pretending that they're lost to take pictures. And then we have TikTok. But what's interesting about this is this is China trying to use soft power, asymmetric warfare, but at the same time, they're scared to death of, of American soft power. That's why Newsmax and Twitter and CNN.com and, and are, are not available in China. That's why uh, U.S. basketball players can't dare say anything negative about China because they'll be censored. It's true. They're using asymmetric warfare, but they're also worried about the power of, a, of American soft power, American asymmetric warfare that could affect their country and influence their people. And General Holt, I remember not too long ago that it was uh, Donald Trump, President Trump, and they stepped up their attacks against China, saying they're the greatest threat to democracy and freedom. And here we are a couple of years later, and once again, Trump was right. No, oh, absolutely correct. Uh, you know, China, and to Fred's point, China really has succumbed to American soft power. And it's not because we had some diabolical plan to inflict it on them. It's that setting the example that if you look at Shanghai or what it used to be before Xi Jinping vaporized the economy, um, you'll see elements of American culture all throughout Chinese cities and young Chinese people aspirational to have a life like their counterpart in the United States would have. That's why there's so many applicants to our schools. So, so ours is more by example, like, hey, be like us. We love freedom and we like to do these things. Um, but President Trump had it right. He treated the regime the way they needed to be treated and he understood the threat. This administration does not. 
and I feel that we're very vulnerable and wide open to more to come from the Chinese Communist Party. Having said that, let me talk to you, Fred, about the failing Chinese economy. Mm -hmm. uh, it seems like under Deng Xiaoping, uh, they wanted to expand. They wanted to embrace more of the Western world. They wanted to embrace uh, capitalism, mm -hmm. to high tech. And then under Xi uh, and the rest of the Communist Party, they become more closed. And, and more threatening, but now their economy is not sustaining where they want to go with this. Are they less of a threat because of their current economic problems? China had an interesting experiment to try to employ capitalism but still maintain Marxism. But ultimately, President Xi decided that that's not really feasible, that eventually capitalism, the free market, free thinking, will destroy Marxism, will destroy the Chinese communist system. So he's rolling back freedoms. He's he's arresting billionaires. He's basically chasing businesses out of the country to make his country more Marxist, to make it more pure. He's ruining what had been achieved by previous Chinese leaders. I think this does make China a weaker country in some ways, but I'm worried that there could be an act of desperation to distract the Chinese people from what she is doing to the country, yeah. that could result in some type of major military conflict. I, I think this is a time of great instability with China. Yeah. General Holtz, want to ask you about a report that North Korea is planning to sell arms to Russia. Could that be? Oh, absolutely. And I'm, I'd be shocked to know that they haven't already done so. Um, the, everybody should just treat North Korea, Iran, China, and Russia as a bloc, as a military alliance, as a mutual cooperation. They could care less about the sanctions that have been levied on them uh, having to do with each other. And, and where we have to put our minds on it is, if we're going to see that kind of cooperation amongst these four, how long will it be before this benefits Iran to the point where they're now a nuclear nation as well? And I think, I think we're very close to that point. Uh, uh, before we go, I wanted to ask you, uh, Fred Fleiss, about uh, Vivek Ramaswamy uh, has been asked about Taiwan. Mm. And more than once he has said, he hasn't backed off of this, that uh, when essentially, when we can absorb the chip making uh, capabilities uh, that Taiwan currently has, it sounds like he's he's kind of saying at that point their value to us is diminished. Mm. Uh, is that a smart position to take? Well, I, I think Vivek Ramaswamy is a brilliant guy, and he did reverse something he said about Israel, and I give him a lot of credit for that. He made some statements about U.S. policy and Taiwan, suggesting that we may not defend Taiwan after we secure our access to computer chips. That, that position is simply wrong. My hope is Ramaswamy will rethink it and put it forward another position. Politicians make mistakes. He's not a foreign policy expert. And I'd like to see him uh, basically correct that and move on to push an America first agenda in this presidential election. Yeah. Real quickly, uh, General, I see you nodding. Quick thought. Yeah, I agree with Fred completely. I, I think Fred's being very fair to him. He's, he's just simply wrong, but he's also new to this politics game, and America loves an outsider, so let's see how he does. <laughs> American loves an outsider with the wrong position on something so important. Uh, but uh, He can evolve. He can yeah. evolve. Okay. <laughs> he's evolving, right. Yes. On further reflection, uh, yes. I did not know what I was talking yeah, about. Yeah, the play does not stand as called. <laughs> but he, he can rap Eminem. That's most important, yeah. right? You know, can do some it underscores why I'm oh, glad I never was Rumble. able to wrap that whole lose yourself song. Uh, General Holt, Fred Flights, thank you, gentlemen. Happy Labor Day. Well, shake up in Ukraine's defense strategy as President Zelensky announces a replacement of the country's defense minister. Alexei Reznikov has served in the role since uh, the war began, but claims of corruption against him forcing Zelensky to go in a different direction. London correspondent Shelby Wilder has more on Zelensky's decision to course correct here. Well, in his nightly address, President Volodymyr Zelensky announced Sunday evening the dismissal of Ukraine's defense minister, Alexei Reznikov. Reznikov served as Ukraine's defense minister since 2021, which is before Russia's full-scale invasion began. He helped Ukraine secure billions of dollars of military aid and equipment, but his tenure was ultimately overshadowed by allegations of corruption. 
There were cases of war profiteering taking place, like the purchase of military goods at inflated prices, which led to investigation probes and President Zelensky firing a number of senior officials at the beginning of this year. Reznikov submitted his resignation today. Meanwhile, President Zelensky said that the ministry needed, quote, new approaches, end quote. And he's proposed a gentleman named Rustem Umarov as the replacement. For last year, Umarov has been the chairman of Ukraine's state property fund. He's also a member of the political opposition party and a leading figure of the Crimean Tatar ethnic group. Otherwise, as for some reaction to this news, given President Zelensky's crackdown on corruption, the move to dismiss Reznikov does not come as a surprise to Ukrainians. But Ukraine's allies are questioning the timing of this move as it takes place as Ukraine's offensive is in full swing. And this decision is being seen as the largest shakeup of Ukraine's defense establishment since the war began. Otherwise, that's latest from me here in Kyiv.